All right, good evening, and welcome to the Steam Power Podcast for, uh, let's see here, it's Saturday, May 31st, 2014. Um, coming back from our two weeks, so we're on a, our every two week schedule now. Uh, last week, got a lot of positive feedback. I got to do an interview with my uh, my old buddy and um, <clears throat> master electrician, uh, Scott Snyder. A lot of positive feedback from that one. A lot of people um, commented on the uh, the idea of being able to talk about science and technology um, and engineering career fields from uh, from another perspective than just the uh, the college education uh, perspective. So, you know, working as an electrician, a technician, um, other fields that didn't really necessarily require that traditional four-year education yet still work in the STEM field. So um, because of that feedback, that I think is really the path I want to go with. Uh, so I'm going to try to arrange some more interviews uh, with some other friends I have and some other folks I know um, <clears throat> who work in various, uh, again, STEAM career fields. Um, and we'll, we'll touch on some that are <clears throat> more traditional, uh, the college-educated route, like pukes like me, um, and uh, and others. I think that was really, really good. So I uh, appreciate the feedback, and we will continue on with that. Uh, hopefully here, hopefully next, let me think, yeah, hopefully next week. Um, if not the week at, or two weeks after, so two weeks from now, if not uh, four weeks from this episode, so we're two episodes away, we'll do another interview like that. So anyway, um, got a couple stories this week. Um, this will probably be a shorter uh, episode, so um, thank you for listening. But I guess let me go ahead and real quick, let me go check this out, see if this works tonight and all this magic technology. Um, yeah, let's see if I can share this. All right, so first of all, we want to go ahead and thank our uh, thank our sponsor for the week, and that is Audible. Um, I think at this point, most people um, know what Audible is, but if you don't know, if you have uh, been living under a rock. Um, Audible is the Audible Books uh, company that is owned by Amazon, and they have approximately, um, I think, 300,000 titles. Uh, so if you're driving, if you are you've got a nice long commute, um, and you've listened to all the podcasts you can stand, and maybe you want to try some fiction or something else, uh, Audible comes in. They, um, again, um, 300,000 titles, uh, some really well-voiced um, books, um, a lot of, uh, actually, a lot of, and a lot of free stuff. There's some, a lot of science fiction stuff that many years uh, outside of its... Uh, Copyright, um, yeah, out of its out of its copyright period, and uh, they've gone ahead and and turned those into audiobooks. So it's pretty cool. Excuse me, why did I say three? I said choose from over 150,000 titles. So I try I try to double their amount of books. All uh, right, so they're at 150,000 titles. That'll change probably in a few years. They'll have over 300. But anyway, if you want to uh, try them out, you can head on over to audibletrial.com slash steampowerpodcast and sign up. You'll get a 30-day free trial. Um, after that, I think it's $14.95 a month. And uh, you'll, with that, you'll get um, a free audiobook of your choice when you sign up for the 30-day trial. If you decide to cancel, keep the book. It's yours. Um and then, uh, but if not, you know, you'll be able to, um, you'll get credits, uh, credit every month, and you'll be able to buy, which is credits usually good for an audiobook. Um, it can be, some of the, some of the bigger books um, can be two, I think, two credits, so you may have to bank two weeks or two months, but, um, but you can always buy uh, outside of that period, too. So anyway, check them out. And we thank Audible for uh, 
supporting the Steam Power Podcast. All right, enough of that rambling. Let's move on to the news. All right, our first story is, uh, for me, it's pretty awesome. Um, It combines pretty much everything I love and my day job, and that is Google is using self-aware data centers to cut to the cost of searching. Uh, What that means is they, um, you know, obviously massive, huge data centers that use, that means they use a lot of electricity. I think this this article says they do about 4 million searches a minute. So all those transistors are firing in there and they're sucking up energy and they're, um, you know, trying to give you back those results in milliseconds or microseconds or whatever they're down to. That takes a lot of energy. So, um, and it's hard to predict really, um, energy usage and consumption because there's so many variables involved, ambient temperature, uh, set points on your your uh, on your controls, how those controls interact, and it's you know not a one for one or a linear process. It's a very uh, you know a lot of feedback loops and a lot of um, interactions that you know we can't really predict ahead of time. So uh, apparently there's a data center engineer there, and I believe his white paper, let's see here, let me give his name, Jim Gal, Gale, Jim, G-A-L, uh, took, um, and this is pretty cool for me, uh, machine learning, uh, neural networks, a way of programming a computer, a way of writing, um, try to take care advantage of uh, nonlinear relationships of data and uh, inputs, and came out with a mechanism to which um, they were able to uh, very closely, um, let's see here, uh, was it point, plus or minus uh, 0.4% um, for a power use efficiency of 1.1. So. Um, let's see if I, can, I think I brought up a link for that. So power usage effectiveness, not efficiency, effectiveness. Um, basically, it's it's the power that comes into my data center, and then how much does that power actually get um, sent to an IT load? Um, and the this article uh, says that the average is about 2.5. So you got to put 2.5 watts of power in to get one watt of power at your server rack. Not very efficient. Now, if Google is really operating at 1.1, um, that means pretty much for every watt they get, they they consume from the the grid, is actually going to uh, uh, to the IT load, which is uh, blows my mind. It's that's very. Um, efficient so but to, so be able to you know to tweak your 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 settings your set points and your controls you got to be able to um, you know kind of model that and basically what they've done is they've developed a model which can help them predict um, what their uh, their usage is going to be and so once you can model that you can start to tweak it and once you can tweak it you can make educated decisions on how to set your your various control systems to maximize um, your efficiency. So that's pretty cool. Um, there is a white paper about it. It's actually um, not too not too hard of a read. It's not a. Uh, I don't think it's, it's obviously not an academic um, college. This is a. This is a, you know a real world uh, working guy. You know trying to explain something clear. It's and it's pretty clear cut my my view of the world, at least. Um, so you can check that out. Those links will all be up in the, the notes for the show. Um, but pretty cool, pretty interesting. You know, like I said, the energy crisis. We got a we got attacked from both the both uh, the consumption side, uh, the supply side, and the demand side. So this kind of um, sort of helps tackle. You know. The, the consumption the, and, and making sure that you know all the systems you we have um, in a data center are operating um, you know, effectively together not just um, looking at and focusing on any one particular area but trying to to model all the interactions and uh, make the center as efficient as possible cool stuff 
Uh, speaking of cool stuff, there is a company, uh, a Finnish company. They're called Indoor Atlas that has um, come up with, uh, surprisingly, I guess, an app um, for your smartphone uh, that basically uh, uses the, the smartphone compass um, and you basically you run this app, you go into a store, and the um, the using the compass, which detects the Earth's magnetic field, looks for variations in that field. And as you're walking through the store, when I have all the aisles and whatnot, um, typically made of steel, or will kind of deflect that compass just a little bit. And by measuring those deflections, they claim with that they can pretty accurately model the interior of a building. Um, so going to uh, competing, I think we talked about the um, the Google effort um, a few episodes back. Um, you know, the the next you know we we so we've kind of conquered the the um, with Google Maps and, and Bing Maps and Apple Maps we've conquered looking outside um, you know with 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 technology such so satellite technology the next the next hurdle is now um, inside the building and doing that um, efficiently it's you know you can pay someone to go in and model and laser scan your buildings um, but that that um, is not very cheap, relatively not cheap, and it changes. So if you re-wicker your aisles, um, you know you've got to come back in and and rescan your stuff. So here, if everyone's walking around constantly, I'm thinking like a a ways concept where everybody's in the store all the time. If this app is running, um, it's constantly updating uh, what it sees and. Um, can can continue to keep the indoor mapping uh, pretty accurate. I don't know if that's the plan or not, but um, I know for me personally as a use case, I can't tell you how many times I get I get sent to the grocery store and go find these 15 things, and it should only take me like 10 minutes, and then like three hours later, I'm mad to the world because I can't find half the stuff on the list that I have because nothing is is where I think it should be or where I was told it should be. If you can imagine now tying this to your inventory um, and I go in with my, my shopping app and just says, hey, here's my 15 things I want to buy today. And I do that ahead of time. I load them into my app or I get my wife to send me that list. Um, and I just go into the store. It says, hey, I know where you're at. And you go <laughs> five feet yeah, uh, this down this aisle, and it'll be to your left, two in, you know, two uh, two feet down or two feet up. Um, make my life a heck of a lot easier. So hopefully, uh, hopefully this is a technology that catches on and gets refined. Um, it is pretty cool. All right, next, scientists find a way to create matter from light. Hello, Star Trek replicator. So we've gotten the the MakerBot the replicators, which you know additive printing. But if you've ever watched Star Trek, you know that a true replicator um, is something that takes a bunch of energy and takes it and whirls it around in magical light, and you get poof matter. Typically, food. I think they've also shown like violins and baseballs and some other stuff get produced. But anything. Um, that you want pretty much so long as some sort of um, blueprint for it exists in the, in the ship's computers, you could ask for and it would be replicated. So <clears throat> the first step of that is how do you, you know, we, we know how to do, um, you know, matter and energy. Um, so here's the first step where basically taking two photons and um, whipping them around and, and doing some sort of uh, basically, magic smashing of these colliding, you know, super energetic photons. Um, they produce now. It is matter. It's electrons and positrons. It's not exactly your cup of Earl Grey tea for now, but it's a start. 
it shows that it is possible to take um, light, in this case the photons, and and given the right conditions. And now they say that it's not as complex as it sounds. They were uh, talking about the article and um, the researchers from the uh, by the, the Imperial College of London or Imperial College London uh, are the ones that did this uh, discovered this technique. Um, they think that you know a lot of the world's colliders, photon to photon colliders, are that already exist are capable of doing this. Um, so we'll see. Now, the article wraps up by saying, you know, even if we can't, you know, at least initially get to um, making our cups of Earl Grey tea, it will help astrophysicists uh, recreate the uh, the conditions within about they say 100 seconds after the Big Bang. So what you know, what did the world look like? Or what did the universe look like um, within about a minute, two minutes of the creation of the Big Bang? So pretty cool. All right, uh, we got about two, three stories left. Uh, so MIT can map the activity of every neuron in an animal's brain, and when we say animal, we're talking about a worm, well they've done it with a, a C. elegans worm and the brain of a zebrafish larva. So um, this worm only has 302 neurons compared to the roughly 100 billion neurons that humans have, but hey, it's a start. Um, it's a system that comes from uh, uh, MIT um, that can produce a complete 3D neural activity map. Um, something that resolves something around called a light field microscope. Don't ask me what that, how that technology works. But um, basically, they're able to look, um, in this case of the worm, uh, what is happening um, across the entire nervous system as it's subject to various stimuli. Um, so long term, um, hope for the system is that they'll refine it. Uh, right now, they can look at the neurons, but they can't get any any finer. Um, you know, they talk about like they can't see actually what's happening in each in the, in the dendrites, the little those little uh, hairy looking things at the end of the neurons that I guess connect them together. Um, so, evolving evolving the technology so you can see that level of resolution as well as um, obviously. Um, being able to handle more than a couple hundred neurons, um, hopefully though we'll get to the to the point where um, they say neuroscientists will be able to pinpoint very specific brain conditions and produce more effective treatments. Basically, if we understand the brain and how it works better. Um, we can uh, create uh, medical care that uh, is more accurate. So pretty cool. All right. Going back a little in the construction and the, in the facility and infrastructure world, so a uh, a company called um, Humanistic Robotics uh, has come up with a uh, system to remotely pilot uh, construction equipment. Uh, that's like they're here using uh, in the picture a little Turex, I think a little bobcat looking kind of thing, um, and what looks like a I don't know, maybe like an old Dreamcast, maybe a Dreamcast um, uh, video game controller, um, some with some obvious uh, some changes. It looks like it's, I guess, VHF, UHF. So it's you know line of sight um, kind of control, um, and basically um, the idea is. Um, you know, especially when you're excavating and uh, mining and whatnot, a lot of conditions are just, you know, a little too unsafe. Now, <clears throat> you can kind of take the human out of the actual piece of the machine and have him or her stand, you know, from a safe distance away, still control. Now, I'm not sure... I don't see like the only added question is like I don't see how what's the feedback mechanism to the operator like there's this tiny little screen so I can't imagine it's and it looks doesn't look like a, a video display it looks like a little LCD display so I'm just curious you know 
what sort of feedback does the human have that's operating it um, to really be able to control it well? But um, you know, it's a start. It is a it's a good start. I can also see this being used in war zones. Uh, you know, obviously, um, especially if you could take it from line of sight and just have it really re you know drop this off and remotely controlled. Um, kind of like, you know, drones, aircraft, drone construction equipment in combat situations would be uh, really handy, I think. So, But it's cool. It is, um, it's at least a start. And our last story for the week. Scientists have created alien DNA. Um or at least unnatural DNA building blocks. So from what I understand of the story, and I am in no way a biologist or a bioengineer, um, they've basically um, created uh, DNA that contains um, different nucleotides than the ones that naturally occur. So if you remember back to your biology class, there was those four letters, A, T, C, and G. Was it adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine, cytonine, something like that. Um, <clears throat> they've, they've been able to increase that alphabet to um, include at least two new unnatural nucleotides. When we say unnatural, we mean not naturally occurring in um, you know they're natural chemicals, but they don't necessarily appear naturally um, in the DNA nucleotide structure. Um, so what this could do, they say, is could potentially. Um, uh, well, the, well, I guess the research that this group has done um, is to be able to uh, create or synthesize cells that produce drugs on demand. So you know, very targeted medicine delivery uh, tailored to an individual person um, is the goal, but that's not to say that, you know, like all technologies, um, whether we like to admit it or not, technology is is not inherently good or bad. It is amoral. Uh, it is us humans that make technology uh, good or bad. Um, and so, you know, I guess conceivably, they thought you could create um, life that uses completely foreign nucleotides. None of the, no A, T, C, or G you could use the replacements. Now, what does that all mean? Um, does that mean it, it's incompatible with us? Does it mean we can reproduce with it? I don't know. I, like I said, I'm not a uh, biologist or bioengineer by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I thought it was a cool story nonetheless and something worth talking about. And uh, All right, so with that, let me go ahead and switch back over. All right, so uh, coming out of our stories, let me um, I want to talk about a new little gizmo I've been playing around with, um, thinking about teaching a class on this. So we've... Um, we've all had, uh, well, I would not say all, but a lot of us geeks, nerds, whatever, uh, we've played in the maker DIY movement. We've played with um, Arduinos, microcontroller-based things. Uh, we've played with uh, Raspberry Pi, BeagleBone, uh, which are single-board computers. So, of course, my computer wants to update Java in the middle of this. So... Apologize for that. Um, so there's also um, now coming out into the consumer grade. At least uh, I mean I think they've been around for a few years. I've just never played with one. Field programmable gate arrays, and this particular model is called the Papilio. Let me see here. So little USB DC parallel uh, DC power jack, micro USB, and I believe this guy, I want to say it was a Xilinx or a Spartan, maybe a Spartan 3E FPGA, and then little, all the pins accessible from some, some heteros. 
So let me switch back over here real quick to... I hope my computer doesn't freeze from trying to want to update. Now uh, let's see here. Here we go. Let's share that. Cool. So Papilio FPGA. Papilio is um I want to say it's Italian for butterfly. Um so real quick, so let's talk about microcontroller, single board computer, field programmable gate array. Um, and then if we take another step, there's also something called ASICs or application specific integrated circuits. So <clears throat> microcontrollers are basically uh, a, a central processing unit with some capability to interface with the real world through analog to digital converters um, and general purpose I.O. pins. They tend to be um, uh, single core, though there are some multi-core, uh, but fundamentally what a, a microcontroller does is takes inputs, does some processing based on a piece of software written. Um, in the case of Arduino, you're using a C or a, yeah, a C derivative language called wiring. Um, and then you are then firing out off outputs onto your pins according to uh, a combination of your inputs and your, your code. Um, and that's all it really does. There's no other magic to a, a microcontroller. It really just says, give me inputs, I will do what you tell me to do with them, and I will react on my outputs accordingly. Now, that's like the Arduino. And there's there's other platforms, the Parallax Propeller, um, and you'll hear terms like um, AVR, um, PIC microcontroller, so there's all these different chips that are out there that fundamentally do nothing else, nothing different than input, process, output. Now, next step up, depending on your point of view, is single board computers. So single board computers are really nothing more than take a full-blown computer, a desktop computer, a laptop computer, shrink it down to the size of basically, you know, like a credit card, um, maybe a little bit larger, and, um, you know, have at it. So basically, it really is just nothing. It is a computer. Um, in the case of like the Raspberry Pi, you're using uh, a Linux derivative uh, distro called Raspbian. Um, so it boots. It has its BIOS. It has its own little kernel. It's um, command line. It can launch a GUI. Uh, it has HDMI inputs, outputs. It has... Uh, uh, let's see, here's the SD card. It's kind of using it as its hard drive. Um, USB hosts, ports. So basically, it really is nothing more than a computer, and it runs a Linux distribution. And you can program whatever you can add to it. Um, you know, you can add Python language. You could add other uh, applications to make it do pretty much whatever you want. Those are all kind of software, to, you know, at the end of the day, to, to make them do anything, though, you need software. You write code. Um, now, let's compare that to an FPGA, a Field Programmable Gate Array. So the fundamental shift is instead of writing software, you are using a hardware description language. So it kind of feels like you're writing software, but what you're actually doing, the guts of an FPGA as compared to a, a CPU or a microcontroller, is kind of like these generic gate um, modules that can be reconfigured. So the hardware itself can be reconfigured um, based on this hardware description language. So what does that mean? What do you get? What's the difference? So when I when I write my code my, in my on my Arduino and I upload it, it runs in that loop. That's why you have to write that loop function. And all it does, there's a program counter that just keeps running that uh, loop over and over and over again. 
Um, FPGAs, it's there. There, you can get code to run on what you create. You could you could like model a CPU and then write code on top of it. Um, but really, what you're doing uh, fundamentally is you're just telling the hardware to reconfigure itself into different gates. So AND gates, OR gates, XOR gates, or exclusive OR, um, exclusive NOR gates, uh, inverters. Um, some of them have, there's a little, um, like the Papilio has, you know, there's some ability to have an analog to digital converter, but that's kind of dedicated hardware that just interfaces. But fundamentally, um, it's, it's those basic logic gates um, you kind of, by writing this, what's called, v there's two languages that I'm aware of, VHDL and Verilog, and the Papilio uses VHDL, and uh, VHDL is a nested uh, acronym, so it stands for uh, VISIC Hardware Description Language, HDL. VISIC stands for, uh, and it's VH... VH... SIC, very high speed integrated circuit. So VHDL, when you write it all out, is very high speed integrated circuit hardware description language. And so the nice advantage of, of, a, of a, for certain applications, an FPGA is better because think about when you're writing an Arduino program and I want to check 15 different buttons or let's five different buttons. All I can, and, and each one will light maybe a different LED. <clears throat> I've got to sit there and pause and go through. Now, I can set up interrupts. Now, that's one way to handle having multiple inputs and to heal with them at the same time. But a lot of times, microcontrollers, um, you probably don't have a, a lot of, of, of interrupts. And they're a little messy to deal with. Um, so it really... What you kind of do is you kind of pull through. You gotta you listen for one as you reach as you go through your code. Um, I listen to one pin, move to my next one, and so it's possible that you know I could be listening to pin one, don't hear anything, start listening on pin two, but someone pushes pin one outside of that loop, and I miss that button press again. Interrupts can handle sort of things that take care of that. But with an FPGA, because you're basically um, you're, you're creating hardware, you're, you're you're designing hardware via a software, uh, what appears to be a software language. Um, it's all parallel. So once I've set up, to, you know, if to my tell my code that says, um, you know, make this pin an input to a uh, a buffer or an inverter or a flip-flop and then take its output and put it out onto a, another pin um, that can all happen in parallel so any any button presses can all happen in parallel and it, it the, there is no code running per se it's not like there's a program counter that's walking through a set of instructions and it just keeps looping that's not what a FPGA does it's it's basically you can imagine it as if you got a bunch of discrete little chips, little the little TTL uh, 7400, 7404, and you were to wire together by hand um, a, a little system, all the inputs can hap can can all happen at the same time. Well, all you're doing is with the FPGA, you're doing that, but you're right, you're using this hardware description language to tell the FPGA to how to reconfigure itself. And um, so yeah, so fundamentally, that's that's the difference. Now there's another step up, which is application-specific integrated circuit. And basically, what that is is you you use HDL, you use a, des a description language to define a circuit, and then you kind of commit that circuit um, to this chip. And you kind of it's like the difference between RAM and ROM. You kind of with an ASIC, you burn, so to speak, whatever design you did in your HDL onto the chip, and that's it. It'll never do anything but that design. An FPGA, though, on the other hand, is reconfigurable. So I could sit here and design 
a a certain system, um, push it to the chip, power it on, and it's gonna every time I I uh, recycle the power, it's gonna still do that same circuit. But when I'm done and I want to work on a different project, I write new code, new HDL, upload it, and I've completely reconfigured. Um, so a lot of times, designers, engineers, what we'll do is when we're building a system with an FPGA we'll, or a system, we'll, we'll build on an FPGA, we'll prototype, uh, we'll test, and then once we feel like we've gotten the design down, we've worked out all the bugs, then you commit into an ASIC for final production. So anyway, uh, so Papilio, if you're interested, if you want to tinker around with that, uh, you can buy uh, Papilio. They're, um, they say you can program it with an IDAE like Arduino. Um, I think what happens is that you're basically taking, you're making um, the uh, Papilio you're going to write HDL to make it look like a AVR or an Atmel chip and then you run your Arduino code on top of that so it's kind of like a little level of indirection um, and you can program it that way but that to me doesn't that doesn't really um, <laughs> that's not the point of the FBGA and, and what you're trying to learn so what you really want to do is download um, from Xilinx, um, and the, on the on the uh, Papilio website, they talk about this. You can download what's called the Web ISE. Um, it's kind of like an IDE for the uh, for various um, Spartan Xilinx micro FPGAs, um, and it's pretty simple. The difference is um, you you do basically everything in the uh, the Web ISE. Except for load it to the um, the PLO. Um because it's a it's a derivative of it's not an officially supported in the Xilinx product. Uh, you write the code, you write what's called a bit file, um, and then there's another application that they provide that takes that bit file that Xilinx comes up with, and then does the ch uh, does the uh, dumping that onto your uh, Papilio. FPGA, but I did it in really 10-15 minutes. <coughs> We're up and running. There's a lot of great examples of what you can do with it on the website as well. Um, think of it like going back to uh, if you wanted to create your own little Atari box and try to recreate what Steve Wozniak did um, to create, you know, <laughs> video games back when he literally the, the the hardware the game was built in the hardware. Well, this is what you you can kind of relive those days with an FPGA. Um, so with that, I'm going to end my rant on those. I really encourage you. So if you if you've messed with Arduino microcontrollers and you've tinkered around with single board computers like the uh, Raspberry Pi, and you're ready for another challenge and that'll ex uh, continue your your uh, education into electronics, I'd recommend um, getting into an FPGA. I like the Papilio because I think it's it's kind of in the vein of Arduino. It hasn't been quite around as long, and it's not quite as clean. And there's a there's a couple other ones coming out that I haven't played with. That I can't really recommend. Maybe we'll talk about those in another episode. Um, but this is a, a good way to learn about how to make systems uh, system on a chip design. You know, you can kind of almost do everything. Um, on an FPGA to make a, a kind of a consumer grade product. Um, yeah, so with that, let me go ahead and uh, let's get ready and wrap this up here for this week. So, um, last thing I do uh, want to just make sure all us geeks know about what's coming up. Um, let me actually, I should probably share my screen one more time. No one wants to look at my mug anyway. All right, it is uh, it's almost June here. And so June in the United States and Canada, uh, if you're an amateur radio geek like myself, 
means field day is upon us. So field day is June 28th and 29th this year. Um, and it's a great opportunity for people, if you want to get to know, if you want to get involved with amateur radio, field day is the best event to go out and see it in action in the real world. You can go to your, your, your a lot of areas. There's an amateur radio club. They meet once a month, once a week, something like that. Um, and that's great. It's a good start. But if you really want to see amateur radio uh, in all of its glory, field day is what you want to go find. Um, there's um, a locator on the website here. You can click in your zip code and it'll tell you where an, uh, a ham club is setting up for field day. Usually they're they're out in the middle of nowhere. They're out in st uh, parks. They're out at um, sometimes they're, they're at county emergency operation centers. But the idea of field day is at its core is let's it, it, it's the once a year amateur radio disaster preparedness drill. Um, it's also a competition. It's an it's an it's an ego thing to get as many contacts as you can. But the idea is, instead of hooking up to power at your house, um, you kind of want to go run on generators. And what would it be like to provide worldwide communications in the event of a natural disaster that wipes out the uh, traditional tele telecommunications infrastructure? In other words, goodbye internet, goodbye telephones, um, hello radio waves um, and you can do that and why I, I recommend field day is so yeah there's gonna be a lot of serious hams that are gonna be running this as a competition and <laughs> you can see them set up the antennas and l watch how power how the generators work and how it ties into radios and whatnot but the nice thing about most of the of those ham groups is they also set up what's called a GOTA station, G-O-T-A, which stands for um, Get on the Air. So it's basically a a station that's simply there for everybody who's not a ham already to come out and experience ham radio. Or if you're a ham but you haven't been very active in the in a few years and you've um, you kind of lost your skills, so to speak. So this is an opportunity to uh, re reconnect with that uh, the that hobby. Um, so June 28th, 29th, uh, recommend if you're if you're interested in amateur radio. This is the one time a year kind of event where you can go out there and see it in action. Um, I am going to try this year to set up um, a station at my local makerspace. Um, we're not going to be kind of a competition. It's going to be pretty much um, a get on the air station solely. Um, there's a lot of rules. I'm not sure if I'm going to follow them all. Um, we're going to we're probably going to power off the uh, the power at the building, but um, and we're only going to probably put out 100 watts because I don't have any sort of amplifier, um, and I don't know if my antenna can handle. Um, but we're going to try. Um, Basically, set it up. We're going to go from about one. It starts at one o'clock on Saturday, and runs about 27 hours until 4 p.m. on Sunday. Um, real hardcore ham groups will have set up a schedule where people will work um, through the night. Um, others kind of shut down in the middle of the night. But um, I'm going to plan on try to get there for at least from like 1 p.m. till midnight. Um, and then, depending if anyone actually shows up, uh, maybe we'll stay later. Um, if no one shows up, then I'll probably shut down and just go home. Um, but that's an opportunity um, for any, like I said, anyone interested in amateur radio. Um, it's a changing world, so you know it's not strictly any more um, Morse code. In fact, in the U.S. now, you don't even have to uh, know Morse code to get. Um, an extra class license, which is the highest. There's now three. There's three classes of license. There's there's technician, which basically gets you on the VHF, UHF bands, which is kind of you know a few miles local kind of chit chatter chatter. Um, rag chewing, as they as the oh, the Elmers call it. That's another. There's all there's a whole language to amateur radio. Um, then there's the uh, after technician. There is the general class. 
which starts getting on the HF frequencies, which are lower frequencies, which means they bounce off the ionosphere, which means you can get around, you can go further. And then the extra class license just adds um, some additional frequencies. Um, really, to do most of amateur radio, you can if you just get to the general class, you'll be fine. Um, but like I said, it's not it's not just Morse code anymore. It's there's a lot of voice, but it's even moving beyond that. The, the, the even the analog radios <coughs> are kind of a thing of the past. Um, there's a technology called D-Star, uh, which is a digital mode of transmission, um, which means all us hams have to go out and buy new equipment, which you know we both love and hate. Uh, it's cool to have new toys. It sucks that they they cost so much. Um, <coughs> but the other big thing. Software defined radio. So, um, you know, really, really tiny and radios now are basically can be kind of like the size of a you know, of a Raspberry Pi. Um, the only thing that limits you really is um, the antenna. The antenna still has to be um, proportional to the frequency and the wavelength that you're transmitting on, and that's not even actually completely true. There has been some. <laughs> some weird breakthroughs, excuse me, in some technologies in the proof of concept stage that really shrink antennas down. Um, so even that may not hold true forever. Um, but so software defined radios, basically running a computer. If you have a computer, you have um, a radio. All you need is a, a basically because um, the idea is instead of instead of having hardware um, demodulate the signal. I just need to take it, step it down to a reasonable voltage uh, into my computer, and then my computer is great at doing calculus. It can do the the the, the, the math to take and and, and demodulate the signal. Um, so that's where SDR really is. I think going to be huge. Um, <coughs> you may be to the point where radios are built into your your computers, uh, and you just fire up an application and and you're done. Um, so, you know, it's not like it's not your grandpa's amateur radio. It's certainly uh, it has entered the 21st century, but it's still new. So, it's kind of like the wild west still with the digital world. So, I think it's a perfect time where the maker movement, this DIY, the STEM education, and the resurgence in amateur radio and the digitization of amateur radio couldn't have happened at a better time. Um, in fact, even with my existing tech, there's um, I'll show it next week. Maybe a little box called the USB Signal Link that I can run a um, an encoding scheme called PSK31 phase shift keying binary phase shift keying, um, and I can basically text message around the world. Um, anybody who's on the frequency, you can kind of write, and you can see. You can and even if you don't transmit, you can sit there and, and capture and watch people type. Uh, ASCII <laughs> messages back and forth bouncing off the ionosphere. Um, it's pretty neat. I've gotten as far as from, from where I'm at in Maryland, um, I made it down into uh, Perth, Australia one night when band conditions were excellent and uh, did a PSK-31. And the other crazy thing about that is um, I was only running 35 watts. So from here to Australia... Digital communication, text messaging, basically, um, on less than it's uh, on a, a, a 60 watt, in, you know, 30 watt, um, so would be a would have been a really low <laughs> brightness incandescent bulb. Um, so, anyway, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up for this week. Um, send in the comments, keep them coming. Uh, I think everyone liked the interview win, so I'm going to try to do more of those. Uh, follow along. We're at steampowerpodcast.com. We're also on Google, uh, google.com or plus, google.com slash plus steampowerpodcast. Um, uh, from the uh, steampowerpodcast.com site, there's all the links, YouTube, uh, iTunes for audio, Stitcher for audio, um, and all that. You can follow along for me if you want to follow me. I'm on Twitter at MB Parks. That's Mike Brian Parks. Um, yeah, so with that, um, 
I will wrap this up for this week. Um, again, thank you all very much for listening. And uh, until next week, stay quirky. <laughs>